I'm Michael Haley Goldman. I'm here representing the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and specifically my colleagues Robert Ehrenreich and Jane Klinger. Um, I think I'm representing mainly because I'm the one who will be talking the fastest uh, so we can make the most out of our 10 minutes. Um, but I'm hoping that they'll be joining me in the Q&A section and, and join in there. Uh, I'm going to give more details about who we are and how we uh, kind of fit together in terms of this. But I wanted to start with thinking about digital humanities at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. For those of you who might not uh, be familiar with us, we are the institution in Washington, D.C. We are a federal institution uh, that has not only a large museum, but also massive collections uh, and a massive research uh, kind of section of the institution. So we're really in the middle of a lot of different pieces that can support digital humanities and the work we've done in the past has been about how do you create an environment that creates more opportunities for digital humanities work around Holocaust history, whether it's the types of research being done with uh, the environment that we've described uh, a little bit in a second, uh, or um, also just the number of people who are doing digital humanities in this area. We've been working kind of around digital humanities, although I don't think we called it that since around 2008. Um, we've worked with uh, projects involving uh, GIS and uh, uh, spatial uh, examination of Holocaust history. Uh, we've been running a fellowship for about four years with an associate um, uh, fellow who really looks at digital humanities techniques and have run small projects ranging from um, everything from machine learning to textual analysis to more mapping type projects. Uh, so recently we were um, in discussions inside the museum to really figure out what next kind of project would support greater digital humanities work around this subject matter and um, and how do we actually think about doing that in a way uh, to support this and, and what's really involved. Of course this means that we are dealing very much with the topic that a lot of you are discussing which is how do you really bring together a lot of different types of expertise and the technology in terms of doing research and, and how do we support that in the best way we can. Uh, the project that um, we'll be describing, the um, is actually looking at the scanning of 3D objects from our collections uh, for the use within the institution. Actually, this kind of came to us because there were a lot of parts of the institution that were looking at 3D objects and the use of those thing, the, those uh, types of objects within the work that we do. And what we discovered is that there's a lot of different types of work um, that could be supported by 3D objects within the collection. Most important, I think, for this discussion is the idea around research. This is the section of the institution that Robert represents, uh, and it's often around the idea of material culture. How do we scan objects in 3D so that they can be used for digital research itself? How do you create them in such a way that um, will allow close examination, but also digital examination of the objects? And also, how do you use this as a way to provide access to collections for research across a lot of different institutions? The other area that I represent is in the kind of the educational group. I come from technology and education. That's where a lot of the technology discussion comes from. We're interested in greater interactivity with the public. We're interested in the idea of having objects that can be used for um, kind of classic object-based museum education outside of the institution. And we're also interested in um, integrating the kinds of digital uh, objects we create into things like augmented reality and virtual reality. So we're coming at it from more of an educational perspective. Finally, the third part of our group is Jane. Jane comes from the uh, conservation perspective. And from a conservation perspective, these kind of 3D objects can be used to create new methods for documenting uh, the objects that we have. Uh, it gives us the ability to show vulnerability of these objects in a way that we couldn't in the past. Um, and then there's always the classic idea that you know, many times we're using, which is that objects that are fragile when they're being used for research are in danger? And are there different ways we can create support for use of these objects without risking the objects themselves? So those were three of the different types of things that we're all interested in. Uh, but then when you actually start looking at it more closely, um, what we find, this is a, a chart that Robert put together that actually starts thinking about the criteria all of these different sections of the institution have. When you're thinking from a research perspective, from an education perspective, or from a conservation perspective, the actual needs you have for 3D objects are, are gonna be quite different. Uh, and so as we're starting to kind of work on pulling together these, um, the idea of moving forward with a large scale scanning project in 3D, um, the actual needs is what we're, we're doing an analysis of right now and seeing how widely different they are. So with the short period of time we have, I won't be getting into that analysis particularly much, uh, but we are looking at uh, a, a, an approach that's going to be a scan once um, and really try to create the best quality digital images that we can in three dimensions 
uh, for all of these different uses. There's a lot of obvious reasons for that. One is we don't want to uh, scan objects more than once. We don't want to risk fragile objects by having them repeatedly scanned in different ways. We also want to optimize staff time, and we also want to share the financial resources. What we've discovered, of course, is that this kind of project is not only expensive, um, but complicated in so many ways that we didn't imagine when we first started uh, doing the research on this. So, you know, if you kind of think about what we've learned so far in terms of, of preparing for um, more of a digital access to these 3D objects for research purposes, um, is what a lot of you have already been talking about. It. But we're actually finding it even within our own institution um, that there, the level of communication has to actually uh, be built on this kind of trust and, and common language that many of you have described already. Uh, the technology itself provides all kinds of complications. Not only is there a steep learning curve in understanding the, the technology, uh, but there's the limits of the technology itself. The technology can't scan certain types of objects very easily. It has difficulty with certain types of complex objects. So even the, the simple idea of creating digital objects for research is itself something that we're learning uh, in greater detail. There's the concept of cost uh, and the usual trade-offs you have between cost and quality. Uh, while you can do photogrammetry, uh, the very simple form uh, of photogrammetry that we've experimented with in the past to create 3D objects, that's relatively inexpensive, but they don't necessarily create the objects you want. Of course, on the flip side of that, you know, entry-level uh, technology on the most extreme is hundreds of thousands of dollars, which is something uh, that is a serious investment even for larger institutions. That doesn't even get into the issues around training and maintenance uh, and upkeep that we would um, need to deal with it. Uh, but then stepping back again into the different types of expertise we're bringing, whether it's from the research end, thinking about material culture, thinking about conservation and the scientific needs of conservation, or from the educational use, we all are coming from different backgrounds and different expertise, which brings different language and approaches to the whole endeavor in the first place. So a lot of our time has been really spent understanding each other in terms of what we need out of this project and where we can go from there. Mm -hmm.